All right, so the way we've got to look at it is training age, level of trainedness or preparation, sport you're involved in, where you are in the yearly cycle relative to the competition calendar, etc. I don't personally pay attention to the words functional, non-functional, etc. because they're Western industry fitness buzzwords and when you want to get down to it, there's no such thing as, as functional or non-functional. It's really all the same thing. There, there is no movement that the human body can execute that does not serve a function. If I'm flexing my finger back and forth, I'm flexing my finger back and forth. If I'm performing this general exercise, this specific exercise, I would first of all recommend to those interested in this industry to eradicate from the vocabulary the word functional versus non-functional because the context that we provide is what is the objective? Sport related, general fitness related, cardiac rehabilitation, obesity, whatever, and then the continuum of specificity to general now has context based upon the goal. So this whole functional, it's, it's, uh, it, it, it lacks scientific foundation, so I don't believe in using the word. It doesn't make sense to me. So, in terms of increasing the cross-sectional diameter of your muscle fiber, there's two primary mechanisms. In increasing sort of the non-contractile elements versus the contractile elements. And that's where we get into this discussion of what is the operational value of one versus the next. Well, in fact, they both ha have operational values. In the earlier stages of development, obviously the young athlete needs a certain degree of cross-sectional diameter to support the development of greater force demands, regardless uh, if there's a greater velocity component or slow tonic force component. So, it's, it's, we'd have to have a specific context to answer your question directly in a general sense the answer is there's validations for both types of training to just simply increase the size of the muscle without concern of the contractile force velocity element of training versus only being concerned about increases in cross-sectional diameter being directly related to force or velocity generation abilities so what we the big, the big sort of determining factor is if we were to delineate between bodybuilding and sports training, we're thinking of muscles in one context, movements in another. And in most sports, it's speed of movements. So the question is, for sport training, what must be done in order to increase the speed of movements associated with the execution of the competition exercise? And the answer is, in certain cases, there's validation for increasing a certain degree of the non-contractile elements of the muscle fiber, therefore increasing cross-sectional diameter, and in other cases, obviously more specifically, increasing the contractile elements. So, there isn't just one answer, there's many, we have to be very specific, and in most cases, the answer is a bit mixed. Certainly regarding the contact, collision, combative type sports, it is of benefit to the athletes to have added, for lack of a better term, cushioning surrounding the skeletal system and joints in the form of muscle mass, regardless of what the constituents of it are, because you can decrease the the impact forces associated with sustaining collisions, which is why elements of bodybuilding type training are warranted, for instance, for American football players, for rugby players, for hockey players, particularly in the upper body, because of the ability to, to dampen the forces associated with collisions. Whereas with other types of sports that don't involve collisions, we would be looking more, particularly in the later degrees of development, towards the training that has the most correlative value in transferring towards improvements in sports results and typically 
that type of training will be farther removed from the bodybuilding type training. But nevertheless, in the general preparatory period, early in the phase of training for athletes, regardless of sport, it always makes sense to have a higher volume of extensive training. And in that extensive training regime, you're much more warranted in performing higher repetitions. It doesn't necessarily mean that we're directly talking about bodybuilding type training, because obviously, to provide specific context, even within the realm of specific training effects of sets times reps, we have to account for load. So if I just give you a high repetition set and I'm not giving you load, that doesn't necessarily mean we're going to induce a stronger adaptation in the direction of increasing the non-contractile elements. So we got to be very specific. There's a lot of variables to consider and in the end, you've got to do what's optimal for each individual, hence the significance of individualizing the training.